Okay, good evening everyone. I'm very pleased again to see that quite a few people are interested in tonight's topic. And I'm equally pleased of course to be able to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Jonathan Layton is a biologist. He's originally from Canada. Um, got his bachelor's from Harvard University, then came to Basel, so to this very place, in order to do his PhD. So he's returning to his PhD place. Um, after his studies, he worked um, in the industry for some time, but then he started gravitating more towards thinking about ethical questions, about big picture questions for humanity and, and the universe at large. Um, he started going into writing, consulting, communication, and in that context, he also wrote his book, uh, The Battle for Compassion, which tonight's talk will be based on. Um, Jonathan is currently working as an independent writer and consultant, and he told me that he's very interested in, in helping to create and support projects and initiatives that deal with um, the big picture questions, and that try to bring rationality, science, and compassion together for a future world with less suffering, basically, I guess. And without further ado, um, let me thank you again for being with us tonight, and the floor is yours. Hey, thanks very much, Adriano. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Adriano and the other organizers for inviting me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. As Adriano said, I. I did my PhD in Basel, and in fact, Basel was the first place I lived uh, in Europe as an adult after finishing uh, college. And I took a real liking to the city of Basel, I, and after leaving, I came back again to do my PhD um, because I really liked the way of life, and it's a city that I really felt at home in. So it's really, it's really a pleasure to be back here and talking not about yeast mitochondrial transport proteins, but about something that I actually care about even more deeply, which is uh, how to make an impact in the world and uh, try to help facilitate a world with less suffering. Um, it's also, it was really a, a nice discovery for me that there's this group of students here in Basel who, uh, who, are, who think uh, or adhere to the principles of rationalism and have a compassionate agenda. And it, it's actually really refreshing to find that a lot of the ideas that I developed in my book uh, through independent reflection and reading uh, seem to be uh, reflected and, and, and find uh, resonance with a lot of the ideas that I think people here have been uh, thinking and, and writing about. So it's nice to find allies. Um, and sometimes Facebook isn't a complete waste of time. So, um, the book that I wrote over a couple of years, which uh, is called The Battle for Compassion, Ethics in an Apathetic Universe. Um, so, what I've tried to do in the book is, uh, is basically to take a brutally honest, big picture approach to understanding the dynamics of the world and, and really what matters and what we can do about it. Now, it's probably not a, surpri not a surprise to anybody here to know that we're living in a very critically important time in the history of the planet Earth and probably, or perhaps even in the history of the universe. Um, this is a period of time where after billions of years of evolution, the decisions we make within just the next few decades could have um, a phenomenal consequences that could determine, for example, whether intelligent life on Earth will have been a short-lived, inconsequential accident or a momentous occurrence for the universe. Now, Martin Rees was uh, a, a recent president of the, uh, of the Royal Society in the UK, and so a respected scientist, uh, globally renowned. And in a book that he wrote several years ago, um, he wrote, I think the odds are no better than 50-50 that our present civilization on Earth will survive to the end of the present century. Now, that's a pretty, pretty gloomy perspective. Now, we never really know with, with, with 
predictions like this, how likely they are uh, to come true, and you know how how close he is to to uh, you know how how real that number really is. But it does illustrate the fact that we're living in risky times, and uh, and we're faced with with risks that never existed before. And really, these risks are uh, the risks that we face are a consequence of the increase in complexity that's occurring on our planet, um, which is manifested in um, dramatic acceleration in, in technology. Now, of course, technology, as we all know, has positive and negative uh, potential consequences. And I don't need to tell you that, uh, you know, the, that the increase in technology that we've uh, seen over the past decades is, um, has led to, you know, dramatic increases in living standards, it's led to uh, you know, the cures for diseases, it's allowed us to communicate with people across the planet, uh, but it's also resulted in potentially dramatic existential risks. Um, and you know, some of the risks that we face are uh, you know, the development of, of uh, bioengineered uh, viruses and other organisms that can potentially wipe out uh, the human species, um, and there are many others. Um, now, this particular uh, slide that I'm showing you here, it comes from uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's, I, I guess a lot of you uh, may have heard of him. Um, Ray Kurzweil is an inventor uh, based in the US, um, and he has written several books over the years that describe the evolution of intelligent machines. And his, I believe it's his, well, his second to last book uh, was called The Singularity is Near, and it describes how um, uh, the, the dramatic increase in computing power coupled with a dramatic increase in our understanding of how the brain works will allow the development of uh, super intelligence and, and this intelligence will be able to improve its, uh, to, to, to modify itself very quickly and this scenario is, has been termed a singularity there are different ideas about what might happen and we don't really know uh, but there are a lot of intelligent people that have thought about it and take this scenario very, very seriously. Um, and this is one of the things that, uh, I think this is one of the, the, uh, um, the issues that, we, that, need, that needs, to be taken, needs to be taken seriously. So, so here we have the situation now where we're, we've got this dramatic increase in, in dramatic acceleration in technology, existential risks. And yet, at the same time, uh, we find that there's still tremendous suffering that still persists in the world. And there are many different kinds of suffering, many different causes. Uh, and just to name some of them, there's the you know, persistence of, of poverty and disease in, in uh, so much of the world. There's the persistence of conflict, of, uh, of people subjected to brutal torture at the hands of their own governments, um, and many other, many other uh, causes of of suffering that, that persists. And so we're, we're faced with this dilemma, in a sense. What, what actually matters? What, are, what should our priorities be? Uh, should we be worrying about, um, about existential risk? Should we be worried about the reduction of suffering? Are there other things that we should be worried about? You know, how, do we, how do we decide what our priorities should be? So this is really, um, these are the questions I've been thinking about and trying to address. How do we think in the, in the most, in, in, the, um, in the largest, broadest way possible about these big questions, about what matters and what we can do about it? Um, I'd like to quote, actually, a philosopher that you may have heard of named uh, Daniel Dennett. And, um, and he wrote... He wrote about how there doesn't seem to be enough room in our collective brains to contain the explosion of memes. So what happens is we end up juggling lots of different ideas that we're exposed to from different sources, including the media, and it's hard to get a really big picture view and, and decide what, what really matters. What are the ideas that matter the most? And even people that we, that we respect like scientists, for example, who are, tend to be among the most respected figures in society, they sometimes have very different ideas about what our priorities should be. So how do we, how do we really decide what matters? How, what, what kind of reasoning can we, 
can we uh, employ to try to get at the bottom of, of these sort of essential existential questions? Well, sometimes uh, sitting on the beach is a good good place to, to do some thinking about things, but uh, I'm actually, um, this slide is actually meant as a metaphor, uh, and I used it in the prologue of my book. But I was actually sitting on the beach in, in Spain a few years ago, and I was looking at the sunset, which is you know, one of the most beautiful natural phenomena, and all of a sudden I had a, a sudden switch in perspective, and I found that I was no longer looking at the sunset in the way I normally do. I was looking at it, as if I really was on the surface of a planet looking at a star in the distance. And it really struck me how, how bizarre it almost felt at that moment to be looking at a very, very usual scene and then to, take it, to be suddenly looking at it in a very detached kind of way. And I realized this is, I think, an excellent metaphor for the kind of exercise that we need to do more often, which is to step back from our intuitive way of looking at things and to take a more detached perspective on things. And um, what this means in practice, in, in a more detailed kind of way, is that we need to think more independently and rationally. Um, and we need repeatedly to ask the little question, why? And apply an analytical questioning approach to our most basic assumptions. Well, you might say, well, that's what, that's what philosophy is all about, right? Philosophers do that. But, and, and philosophy, in a way, is the most essential discipline there is, because it really tries to, to get to the meaning of life and, and ask these questions. But I think one of the problems with philosophy is that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the big questions have been, um, I mean, they've been addressed you know, since hundreds, since thousands of years, but we're, we still get locked into these old ways of thinking about them. So, for example, when, when we take the field of ethics, um, you know, there, there, there are different uh, currents of thought that go back a very long time. Um, uh, you know, we have, we have the religious codes that go back thousands of years. We've got uh, the notion of virtue ethics, deontology, consequentialism. And, and yet today we've got, we've got this explosion of knowledge. We have fields like evolutionary um, evolutionary psychology, we have quantum physics and game theory. We have a, you know, a much better understanding of how the world works and, and, and how human nature works. And the old sort of paradigms for thinking about ethics and philosophy, I think, are no longer sufficient. And another phenomenon with philosophy is that people sort of tend to get pigeonholed, you know, there, there are these different strains of, different, uh, different ways of looking at, at problems, but what happens is that people, philosophers, um, they tend to identify with, with a certain approach to a problem, and, and it's almost as if there's a lack of, lack of communication. Um, every sort of, every approach is almost sort of seen as, as being mutually, ex mutually exclusive with others. And I think part of the problem is that what you find in philosophy is that philosophers often disagree about the meaning of, of words. Um, and in fact, ideally what we would want is a coherent way of thinking about ethics that, that bridges all this kind of misunderstanding. Um, and I think a lot of the debates in philosophy are really false debates. We just need to be a little bit clearer about what we're actually talking about. So one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that's essential in building up an argument is to know what your starting assumptions are. And to have proper starting assumptions, they need to be based in the truth and they need, we need to be prepared to question them um, and confront them with new evidence or even new ways of thinking. And this is part of the, of the problem, I think, in, um, in, in many countries, including the US, is that certain things get written down and, and they're beyond um, beyond, they're, they're not considered, uh, it's not considered valid to question them. Uh, and I think it's essential to go as, down as deeply as we can and question our very starting assumptions so that any theory that we develop will be as coherent and consistent as possible. Okay, I think one of the, one of the important 
starting points for, for before we even start thinking about what matters is to understand how things work. And you know, the, the, the whole issue of, of free will and determinism is a classic one in philosophy. Um, and I think, again, this is part, partly a, question, a matter of, um, part of the problem is that people are not always clear about what they mean. But if you take a very sort of scientific, detached way of looking at, at, um, at, at humans and, and, uh, and, and our place within the whole universe, you have to understand that brains, minds are part of a larger system. Okay, so no brain, is, uh, no brain operates in isolation. We're all subject to influences from our environment, and everything is basically a network of causes. Okay, so you know, we, freedom, freedom is actually an internally felt phenomenon, but we're not free from the universe, we're not free from influences. And so if we want to find solutions to, to the problems that we face in the world, we need to look at everything as if it's part, as we need to look at it in terms of a, a system. Um, and one of the consequences of thinking like this is that we, it's not useful to, to, to blame, but rather we need to be thinking about how we can change the system um, so that it gives us the output that we want. So some of the other, other key principles are, well, we have randomness at the quantum level, but it leads to order on a larger scale. And we also find that some very simple principles, some simple algorithms can lead to great, great amount of complexity at a micro level. I've given an example here of, of an ant colony where ants are basically obeying some, very, you know, some relatively simple principles about what to do in each situation and the result is something, something very complex. And the same applies to, to the human world. Um, the, the, the world that we live in is extremely complex, but it's basically the result of humans following some very basic drives. And one of the most important is the drive for status. And yeah, this, is, this is probably one of the most fundamental ways of understanding human nature. So we need to, if we, if we don't like the way that things are developing, we need to, we need to make use of our understanding of the whole system that we're part of and find ways of tinkering with it. And just to give you one example here, uh, this is just basically a, a fairly random graph that I pulled off the internet and it just shows the incarceration rate in the US. Um, now, you know, it was stable for quite a while and then it, and then it went up very quickly. And you know, how, do you deal with it? how do you deal with issues like this where people are being put in jail for, for their whole lives? Um, you know, one, one reaction is to say, well, people, people are free and uh, you know, if they've, if they've committed a crime, then we should put them in jail. But the more rational approach is to say, well, there's something, there's a problem with the system. And if we want to change, uh, if, we, if we don't like this kind of result, then we need to do something about the system, not blame people. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, um, the rationalistic perspective I think we need to adopt to begin with, that we need to understand how things work and then see how we can tinker with them. Okay. Now let's talk about how we can think about what really matters. And you know, how, how can we build up a theory of ethics that's based in, on the most, um, the, uh, most rock-solid assumptions that we can come up with? And I think the starting point is that subjective experience is at the heart of what matters. Okay, this is the kind of, it's almost axiomatic in the way, uh, in the way of Descartes I think, therefore I am. It's, it's, almost, it's, it's in, almost inherently obvious that if, if there's no subjective experience, there's nothing for anything to matter to. So whether it's man-made objects or phenomena of nature or the planet or any kind of metrics like, uh, you know, like GDP, growth rates, all of these things are completely irrelevant if there aren't brains, if there aren't minds for it to matter to. And that, you know, that may seem like an obvious fact, but we sometimes find that people seem to attribute a lot of attention to objects and to things without thinking about how they actually impact on conscious beings. And so ethics, 
ultimately, ethics is about subjective experience. Um, it's ethics, in a way, it's the most central human activity because if it's interpreted in the most meaningful way, it tries to put subjective experience right at the heart of what matters. The next step would be to say that intense suffering is what matters the most. Now, you would ask maybe, why is that? How, how can we make that claim that intense suffering is the one thing that matters the most? And again, this is almost something that should be intuitively obvious in that anyone who... It, it, it's the kind of thing that you only realize how much it matters if you are exposed to real suffering yourself and then you see how awful it is. Suffering is something you almost need to feel viscerally to recognize why it should be the core concern of society. So intense suffering is inherently and overwhelmingly bad in an almost axiomatic way. And to take a quote from my book, fear of having one's life or well-being taken away and the physical pain caused by other creatures or chance are the ugly side of the universe. So there's, I don't think there's anything as urgent or important to a human being or an animal as the relief of intense suffering. No striving for happiness has anywhere near the same intensity as the desire for intense suffering to stop. But if we're not fully aware of the subjective reality of intense suffering, whether due to torture or armed conflict or debilita debilitating illness or whatever the cause, then we're missing something essential in our knowledge of a situation. So this is one of the problems with subjective experience, is that it's, it's so inaccessible to somebody who's not directly exposed to it. And yet, it's the heart of what matters. So if, if anyone is trying to make, a, make an, um, a judgment about ethics, about what pr our priorities ought to be, they're missing something essential from the situation if they're not aware of what intense suffering really means. Um, and I... Um, an example that I actually quote in my book is of um, uh, Ingrid Betancourt, which, who you may remember was a French Colombian politician who was kidnapped by the FARC in Colombia and uh, held hostage for six years. And when she was released, she had the intention to write a play because she wanted that those who will see what I experienced will understand that we must be careful never to fall into this abyss. And of course, suffering is suffering wherever it occurs. And we don't have any excuse anymore with our knowledge of, with our understanding of, of uh, animal psychology and, and uh, the, the correlation between brain structures and the ability to experience pain. We no longer have an excuse for minimizing the importance of suffering that occurs in animals. And I would say that human abuse of animals is one of the greatest sources of suffering on our planet. The, the extent of suffering inflicted by humans on animals is unfathomable. And because it is so widespread and commonplace, it is all the more difficult to come to terms with how bad it really is, as this would force us to acknowledge that we've been making a terrible mistake all along. And that our belief in ourselves as good people reflects a de devastating, though often unintentional, hypocrisy. The use of animals as objects is so entrenched in human cultural practices, uh, practices around the world that to step aside and see things objectively requires almost a Copernican paradigm shift. Now, <clears throat> um, there, there's another, um, a whole other aspect to, human, to, to animal suffering, which is the suffering that occurs naturally uh, among wild animals. And this is something which is also starting to receive a little bit more attention um, it's not preventable nearly as easily as, uh, as human-caused suffering. But again, um, I still think that we need to take an approach where we don't make a clear distinction between what happens independently of us and what is caused by humans. Um, we are the stewards of the planet. There's nobody else who's going to do anything about it. And at some point in the future, this is probably going to be um, a concern that, we're gonna, that more of us are going to have to pay attention to. It's not an easy argument to make because a lot of people, a lot of people feel that there's something sort of untouchable and pure about nature. But in fact, nature 
evolves spontaneously over, t over time the same way that we did. And if we care about suffering, then any suffering should matter equally, regardless of what the cause is. So, do you need, is suffering limited to biological creatures, or is it possible that computers could suffer as well? And I don't mean when you get upset with your computer and you bash the screen. Um, the, it, it may seem kind of uh, far-fetched, uh, something out of a, a 1950s sci-fi novel, uh, but the idea that computers could eventually become conscious and even potentially experience suffering um, is something which I think is almost certainly uh, possible and could actually come true if it hasn't already. And the reason is that suffering is, well, any conscious experience, including suffering, is simply the result of a certain kind of neurological wiring and the firing of, of neurons within this structure. And there's no reason to think that it couldn't also occur using non-biological substrates. In fact, there are a couple of uh, new projects that are being initiated. One actually in Lausanne uh, at the EPFL that received um, something like a billion euros in, in uh, European Union funding. And then there's a new project that was apparently just announced in the US by President Obama. Uh, and both are intended to, uh, to simulate the functioning of the human brain. Um, I think it's not uh, far-fetched to imagine that, that at some point simulations of the human brain will actually cause uh, consciousness uh, in using these non-biological substrates. Now, until we, until we know what actually what kind of uh, wiring it takes to produce pain. I don't, think we can, I don't think we can rule out that we might actually be doing it, even if inadvertently. Um, so I'm not saying that this is an immediate problem, but I'm saying that it could be in the future, um, and especially with the development of artificial intelligence. Um, this may be something that we, need to, uh, that we need to take into account. Because in theory, in theory, it would be entirely possible to create a computer um, that feels the worst, most intense form of suffering, and we wouldn't even, we might not even know that this was happening. So, this is, I didn't mean to, mean to necessarily spend so much time on this topic, but I think it's, it is food for thought. So, let's get back to the question, why should we care about other suffering? Why does it actually matter so much to relieve other people's suffering? And I think this is probably the most fundamental, or one of the most fundamental problems in ethics. In a universe where nothing matters on its own and things just happen, the importance of relieving others' suffering is not something that we can, that we can prove in a sort of mathematically uh, solid way. And like the self-evident importance of subjective experience to those having it, it's not even axiomatic, but it is as close as one can get in ethics in a deep, intuitive way that most people would, in principle, fortunately agree with. And I think there are two very different ways to, that, that, that we come to care about other people's suffering. One is just through visceral empathy. It's a very natural phenomenon when you're exposed directly to somebody else, else's suffering unless you're a psychopath, or you, if you have actual mutations that cause you to not to be able to feel empathy, um, it's a pretty natural reaction to feel somebody else's pain as if it's your own. So it, it's fortunately that we have this capacity, and even though there are many self-centered people in the world, uh, when you're exposed directly to somebody else's agony, uh, it's something which you feel, and, and I think most people react in a in an altruistic way when they're confronted directly with suffering. But there's also a rationalistic approach where assuming that you're already capable of knowing what suffering is about, um, by thinking about the problem rationally, you can attribute more importance to the suffering that occurs in others. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about this. Um, and and, and the, the whole what this is all about is um, the fact that identity, our own personal identity, is something of an illusion. 
now we we all need we all need to feel like we're that our that we have this very solid personal identity that is continuous over time and that is distinct from other people it's part of what gives meaning to our lives this idea that we have this continuity but when you think about things from a more detached perspective you realize how much more fragile the sense of identity is than, than you might think so our bodies change over time. All the molecules in our body, or most of the molecules in our body are replaced, you know, over, over days and weeks. So we're, we're actually not really physically the same person we were, um, you know, a, a month or a year ago. But perhaps in a more important way, even the patterns of our, our brain activity change over time. We, we change because we're exposed to new experiences, we have new life experiences, we have new memories, we have their biological changes. So. It's not an exaggeration to say that we're not quite the same person that we were in the past and we aren't quite the same person that we will be in the future. Similarly, there's a lot more similarity between me and you or any two people than, than we might at first think. So the point here is that identity is not a black and white phenomenon. Identity is actually more of a... a um, there's an overlap in identity and there, sometimes there's more overlap and sometimes there's less overlap. Okay, so this is a very kind of unintuitive way of thinking about it, but it's actually, it's actually the conclusion that you're forced to come to arrive at if you really think about things in a sort of detached metaphysical way. And yeah, on this, on this slide here, I'm, just to illustrate it, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor wasn't quite the same person as Arnold Schwarzenegger, the, the, the bodybuilder. But similarly, uh, to, uh, or let's say conversely, uh, two twins, uh, they're not quite the same person, but they're not quite a, a different people. So they have a very strong overlap in their identities. And when you start to think of things like that, you realize that suffering occurring to one person is equivalent to suffering occurring to another person. And if you really take a detached view of things, you would even say that suffering occurring to you is equivalent to suffering occurring to me. Now, the, the, the intuitive view of identity would say, well, I matter most. But if you step outside yourself and really try to take a very detached perspective, you would say that it doesn't really matter where our suffering is occurring, whether it's me in, the, me in the present, or me in the future, or you in the present, or somebody who doesn't even exist yet. Suffering occurring is, matters as much whether it's here, now, or somewhere else physically, or somewhere else in time. And just to kind of illustrate this point, um, a, an artificial intelligence researcher that I think many of you have heard of wrote on his website, uh, you should regard anything from 2001 or earlier as having been written by a different person who also happens to be named Eliezer Yudkowsky. I do not share his opinions. So, let's talk a little bit more about specific theories of, of ethics. One of the most uh, mainstream ways of thinking about ethics is known as classical utilitarianism. And it, utilitarianism basically means the greatest good for the greatest number. So the idea is that in an ideal world, we, we try to reduce the amount of suffering, and we try to increase the amount of happiness. And that seems logical. It seems intuitively. To, to make sense, because that's, that's, that's basically what we all want. We want less suffering, we want more happiness. So what's the problem with utilitarianism? The problem is that it, it puts happiness and suffering on the same scale, as if they're all just different measures of one parameter uh, that we could call utility. But does that really make sense? A philosopher named uh, David Pierce, uh, who is based in the south of England in Brighton, and um, he is one of the um, one of the strongest and best known advocates of what's called negative utilitarianism, has written: "No amount of happiness or fun enjoyed by some organisms can notionally justify the indescribable horrors of Auschwitz." That's a very powerful statement, and for me, it really encapsulates the essence of negative utilitarianism. 
which is that there are some things that are so horrible that no amount of happiness can possibly balance them out. Now, it, it may seem strange, given that that seems to make a lot of sense. It may seem strange that negative utilitarianism, um, which puts, puts all the emphasis on reducing suffering, hasn't received a lot of support in mainstream philosophy. Now, there are a couple of, couple of arguments against it, and one of, the, one of the main ones is that if you really try to apply this philosophy uh, as consistently as possible, you may find it, it seems to imply that we ought to destroy the planet. Okay? If, you, if, you really, if you'd really try to be perfectly consistent. Um, but I would argue that negative utilitarianism, if we don't, if we don't take an absolutist uh, approach to it, if we don't treat it as an absolute dogma, is probably the most essential, most meaningful stance from which we can build up a more coherent approach to ethics. Because if you think about it, you know, if you imagine that life on Earth had been planted by some deity with a long gray beard, you'd have to conclude that it wasn't quite ready for release. It was maybe more of a beta version, because life doesn't seem to have some basic safety measures uh, built in. You know, if, it, if, if life were, were a product that had been released, it would be subject to a massive recall. But, as, you know, as I was saying before, we're, we're the stewards of the planet now. We are the ones who have to, have to make decisions about where things will go. So, in a sense, we're forced to play God. And so, we have this sort of fundamental question that we need to address. Is existence inherently worthwhile? I mean, you hear talk of, of, um, you hear talk of colonizing space, of colonizing other planets. And in a way, that's a little bit like trying to start life all over again in a new place. Would you make that decision? If you had a, uh, an empty planet and you, you could, it was up to you, you had the full responsibility for deciding, are you going to plant the seeds of life on that planet by pushing a button or releasing a vial with bacteria and allowing, allowing Darwinian evolution to occur all over again? That would be a pretty momentous decision to make. I mean, our intuitive... Our intuitive um, reaction would be to say, yeah, well, life is great, you know, just let, let's have more of it. But when you think about all the suffering that would result from it, you would, that would be a pretty, a pretty serious decision to make. And I'm quite sure anyone that was faced with the concrete consequences of that decision would agree that that would be a mistake. And I'm going to show you a little clip here from the film The Fifth Element where Lilu is exposed to the consequences of war. After she sees all these different, uh, different uh, photos of showing some of the terrible consequences of conflict and torture that have occurred just in the 20th century, she, she says, uh, what's the use of saving life when you, when you see what you do with it? So, it's a question worth asking. Is life itself actually worth preserving? Now, James Martin, uh, who was the founder of the Oxford Martin School at the University of Oxford, which I believe also houses the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, he wrote a book, which uh, I read a couple of years ago, in which he, he wrote, to run the risk of terminating homo sapiens would be the most unspeakable evil. That's a pretty strong statement, considering all the suffering that accompanies life. On the other hand, uh, in contrast, one of the other, um, another uh, great dead philosopher named Arthur Schopenhauer wrote something very different. He wrote, to desire immortality is to desire the eternal perpetuation of a great mistake. So two intellectuals with very different opinions about the actual value of life. So which view is closer to the truth? Oops. Sorry. So this actually, I think, encapsulates, or this brings us to the, the essential paradox of ethics, which is that life itself is suffering. And, and I'm going to quote a uh, quote from my book again. Um, Philosophical inquiry is often constricted by an implicit need for arguments 
that are consistent with life being, being intrinsically worthwhile. It's a conclusion that we obviously want to arrive at, but if we are to be honest, it's not foregone. This is one of our greatest taboos. But I think we need to be prepared to break this taboo and touch the void if we want to be honest in our ethical thinking. And so the question is, can we adopt the principle of negative utilitarianism and still embrace life? So what is the value of our species? Would the destruction of our planet be a good thing? And as I was saying, I think this really may be the ultimate paradox of ethics for the humanist who struggles for compassion and at the same time strives for existence. Now, pure reason might suggest that our overriding purpose on this earth is to try to eliminate intense suffering, even if it means repudiating existence. But as a life-loving human being who still cares about others, can I still embrace existence? Can I be ethical and still fight for survival? Or is my instinctive sense of being a good person actually misplaced or wrong? Are classical humanists fighting for the wrong cause? Now, as a way of trying to, trying to find a solution to this problem, I came up with a term which I called negative utilitarianism plus. So maybe we can still have both. Maybe in practice we don't really need to decide between existence and reduced suffering. Um, and as I wrote in my book, we could probably never end the world in a way that was instantaneous, physically painless for everyone, unaccompanied by anxious anticipation, and not least of all, universally accepted. So and a, and a, cat a catastrophe of global proportions that wiped off life on our planet would be accompanied by immense suffering. So maybe the question I posed isn't really that relevant in practice, and we can sort of breathe a sigh of relief and say, okay, we can devote ourselves to reducing suffering, and we don't have to worry about this question of you know, the value of, of existence. Let's just go on with our lives and do the best that we can to reduce suffering. But the emergence of artificial superintelligence is a major game changer. Because super artificial intelligence might find ways to create extreme situations. Now, the computer scientist Steve Omohandro has written and, and talked about this, that self-improving artificial intelligence with simple goals that have nothing to do with us might decide that we're getting in the way or that, that humans could be used for its own purposes. And this is, a, I think, a, a really important insight. It means that even if artificial intelligence develops that isn't intentionally harmful to us, it might decide that it can better achieve its goals. And we're, providing the, we're assuming here that this is intelligence that can learn, that can con continuously and very quickly modify its own programming. Um, it might decide that it, it can make better use of our matter uh, by turning it into something that it's programmed to do. So this, this really sounds like science fiction, and yet people take these kinds of scenarios very seriously. And so it actually becomes very important that any kind of super artificial intelligence is programmed in with the right values. And then we sort of get back to the question that I was just talking about before. If we have to make a decision, what would be the primary priority for the super AI? Would it be uh, prevent any kind of prevent all kinds of intense suffering or try to preserve existence. If the priority were strict negative utilitarianism, it might find a way of destroying the planet and all consciousness as quickly as possible, perhaps calculating that this is the best way of reducing suffering. Even a strictly utilitarian calculation based on the net reduction of suffering might permit a painful end of humanity if the net effect were the elimination of vast amounts of future suffering. On the other hand, if we decided, okay, well, the priority should really be to preserve life, we might find a future with vast amounts of, of, of suffering contained in it. And yet, somehow, there will have to be explicit principles programmed in. And it's not yet clear what they should be. But how we program any future super AI, it, it shouldn't depend just on existing human preferences and values, because... As we know, the average values of humanity, as reflected in the state of the world today, are not a fantastic starting point. 
They include self-interest, competition to the point of death, irrationality, eye for an eye justice, and lack of compassion. So the inv- I think the, inv- the avoidance of intense suffering is a much better starting point. Now, we've been talking about these, sort of these big questions about the value of, of the species and, and, and the necessity of reducing suffering. Um, I'd like to take the same kind of rationalistic approach to thinking about the actual value of an individual life. Now, again, our intuition would say that you know, preserving any kind of life matters. And you know, we have the, the, the strong intuition that, that any kind of murder is wrong. And obviously, that's a good thing. But if you think about it in a very, again, in a very sort of detached, rational way, you could say, um, you could say that the, the disappearance of an individual life in an instant um, wouldn't really matter in the sense that if I'm not around, I can't really care anymore, right? If I'm, if I'm here and something happens, I, I disappear from one second to the next. There may be other people that care and that would suffer, so that ha- needs to be taken into account. But the, if, some, if somebody ceases to exist from one moment to, to another and there's no suffering involved, in a certain way you could say, well, maybe that's not as bad a thing as, as the suffering itself. Now, I'm not saying that this is the kind of philosophy we should necessarily adopt. I'm just saying that this is what a, a detached, rational perspective might say, well, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be as bad as somebody actually being forced to suffer for a long time. Um, in practice, we can still refuse to accept the kind of world where things like that would happen, um, because it's not the kind of world people would want to live in. But I think it's just worth seeing you know, where, where this kind of rational approach will lead. Um, and the same applies to, to the, if, we, if we apply the same kind of thinking to the value of an animal life. And in some ways, it becomes even more relevant here because you know, there, there are a lot of different perspectives on how we should treat animals. And, and as I was saying before, I think we all, everyone here would agree that suffering is suffering and, and the suffering that an animal experiences can be just as intense as what a human experiences. But what happens if an animal has lived a happy life and then it is killed in a way where that's absolutely painless and has no anticipation that that's going to happen. Would that be a bad thing? Now, you know, there, I'm, I'm not advocating this, but I, I would say that there is a case to be made, at least in principle, for compassionate omnivorism, which is, would be one where animals just don't suffer a lot. They live happy lives and then they're instantly killed and, and then they're consumed. Now, again, we can take... We, we can still decide that um, this is not the kind of world we would want to live in. And I think the same kind of compassion that leads us to care about animal suffering would also um, lead us to not want to make that kind of decision either. But again, there's, there's a certain conflict here between what a detached view would say that if we, if we say that the most important thing is the reduction of suffering, then if there's no suffering, then then that, that kind of scenario may not matter so much. Um, and, and again, it, 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 it's our compassionate instincts that might tell us that, that even if the animal didn't suffer, we still want to accord respect to, uh, to other conscious beings. So I'm bringing this up just to show that uh, it's not always clear what, what would be, or if there is any kind of right uh, approach the, ra- the same rationalistic approach that we want to adopt in, in being very sort of uh, objective about things might also lead us to say that um, if there's no suffering involved, it, it doesn't matter. And this is where I think it's good that our intuitions can kick in and, and also give us a bit more of a humanistic perspective on things. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll come back to this point in a, in a minute. So, so let me ask you now, uh, sort of, it's a big question. Is there actually a solid basis for ethics possible? And, and I think it really depends on what our demands are. I think we have to accept that we cannot derive an absolutely rigorous, logical argument the way we can in mathematics. We can't prove anything about the way people ought to act in quite the same way that we can establish facts about objective reality or even in the way that we can make solid inferences about the quality of others' subjective experience. So even the logically purest theory of ethics 
still demands a retreat from some of the intuition that as humans we presumably want to preserve. And it, and, um, and it also includes a willingness to entertain the possibility of non-existence. So, so again, a pure, a pure theory of ethics conflicts with some of our intuitions. Um, and I would say that ultimately what ethics is, is a battle for compassion. And, and that's why I chose that as a title uh, for my book. Um, ethics, in my opinion, is a battle to increase awareness and to take concrete steps to reduce suffering. It's about serving as compassionate caretakers of our planet and about limiting the harm that can be inflicted as a result of the pursuit of self-interest. Because a moral argument, even when it employs rationality, is ultimately an attempt at persuasion. It's an attempt to focus um, attention on and attribute importance to certain truths about subjective experience and to try to persuade people to consider other creatures suffering as equivalent to their own and to act on this truth. So again, I think in some ways there's a fundamental conflict between intuition and rationality. Um, we would, you know, we would like to rely on rational thinking, and yet there's this irrational intuitiveness that is still at the heart of what it is to be human. And I believe we still need to hold on to this intuition. We need this intuitive sense of identity for our lives to have meaning. The moment that you admit that you give greater priority to your own well-being, or even to the well-being of your family or friends, than to that of strangers or, or other anim or animals, you're implicitly admitting that you're not willing to adhere to a purely rational, detached view of identity in your ethical thinking. But I think that's okay. That's part of being human. And the positive feelings about life that we have during happy moments make the full embrace of a rigid, negative, utilitarian ethic virtually impossible. How can the sheer joy sometimes of being alive be considered such a guilty pleasure? So I think there's a, I think there's a certain distinction that we're, we, we're, we should be allowed to make. Um, a distinction between our intuitive biases, which are partly necessary for our sense of being human, and the ethics that we try to encode from a detached, rationalistic perspective, which can make a somewhat more detached use of numbers. So just as intuition and, reality and rationality can be seen as sometimes in conflict, um, compassion, which is also partly an intuitive, uh, an intuitive feeling, is also a partner of rationality. Raw intuitive compassion is an essential partner of reason and a basis for ethics. So I think we need them both. I think these are the two pillars that ethics actually stands on. Okay, how precise can we actually be though? Can, we still want to use reason, we want to try to, we try to, we want to, we need some help in our decision making. We, we want to make the best decisions possible in, the, in this complex world that we live in. Now, I think anyone who's had an ethics class has heard of the trolley problem. And very basically, it, this is a situation where you've got a trolley on a track, and it's, it's going to hit a whole bunch of people unless you um, divert it so that it will actually hit just one person instead. And there are different versions of it where you actually have to push somebody onto the track and, and block the trolley. And basically what this problem illustrates is the... Again, it's the conflict between what a detached view of, of, of ethics would tell you to do, which is like save the greatest number of people, and your intuitive sense that you don't want to take an, an, an active step that will kill somebody. So the question again is, do we want to override our most basic human feelings? Um, what would it actually feel like then to be human if we're living in a world where we, where we override our intuitions? And so I've, I've got three slides here where I'm going to go through uh, the, um, what I think the limits are of an ethical calculus. Okay? So to start with, suffering is a blanket term that covers qualitatively different experiences. So I think we can say that all things being equal, the fewer being suffering for the least time, the better. Um, but uh, we can also say that suffering of a fixed intensity can in principle be fairly redistributed over more people for less time. But the problem is suffering, it's not divisible into discrete units. Many people suffering a little is not equivalent to a few people suffering a lot. 
And so, even though we can attempt to rank suffering, we can say, I would prefer to, I would choose A over B, it's very difficult to quantify it meaningfully. It's very difficult to arrive at a, a conclusion that says uh, X number of people suffering an intensity A is equivalent to Y number of people suffering intensity B. And I think, you know, even though we, it, would be a, it would be great if we could derive some sort of equation like that, I think in practice it's virtually impossible. And this is even more so when we're dealing with unbearable suffering, the worst forms of torture. Unbearable suffering has a qualitatively different aspect to it. Um, intense, unbearable suffering that one desperately wants to stop is not comparable with a dust speck in the eye or a paper cut or, or a really bad day or any other experiences that most people would accept as part of a life worth living. There are some kinds of extreme pain and distress that no creature should ever have to endure. And their avoidance, I think, should be our highest ethical priority. Um, the lumping together of all forms of pleasure and pain, or even just of different forms of pain, as values for a single parameter, such as a utility function, that can be subjected to math mathematical manipulation, is, I think, one of the big one of the greatest logical fallacies in contemporary moral philosophy. I, 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 and and there, are, there are examples of, of rationalists who, who, will, um, who will make these kinds of claims. And there's one in particular uh, who has who said who, that um, he would choose one person being tortured for 50 years rather than having a huge number of people have a, a speck of dust in their eye because because he somehow decided that, that, uh, that on balance, uh, the utility was greater by having one person tortured for 50 years. And I think this is, this is a flawed argument. It's a flawed re uh, form of reasoning. And I, and I, I re would really hope that this kind of reasoning doesn't ever get incorporated into a super artificial intelligence as part of its basic values. A couple of other principles here. Um, Cold calculations of suffering, even if they're apparently compassionate, can have an, an inherently dehumanizing element if they require the active causing of suffering. And an example here is the drone strikes, which I know Adriano wrote about um, recently in the Innocent Side Campus. Um, for, there are a couple of problems with drone strikes. Is, one is that uh, we don't actually know what the, what the net balance is. How many lives are they actually saving? But even if drone strikes actually saved more lives than they actually uh, wipe out, um, there's still something inherently dehumanizing about subjecting people intentionally to this kind of suffering. And, you know, we can do all the calculations that we want, but we still have to ask ourselves the question, is that do we really want to live in a world where we think that this is okay? I'm not saying that, you know, that this is, that what I've written here is necessarily the, the, um, the, you know, the final answer on it, but um, I would want, not necessarily want to live in a world where everything is done by cold calculation. Um, and to quote again from, uh, from my book, we can't allow the set of laws that we've inherited to become an empty shell from within which the emotions and empathy which originally sustained them have meanwhile slowly disintegrated. And the same humanistic instinct that says that killing animals is bad, even if done painlessly, also warns us against turning the exercising of compassion into a cold, dispassionate numbers game. What kind of world do we really want to live in? So a couple of further conclusions. I think we should be, we should be careful not to stigmatize compassionate people who are having limited local impact. But whenever we have new choices to make, and we're free from existing biases. For example, a friend or relative who has a disease and we suddenly become very concerned about this disease and want to fund it. There are lots of examples of that where people are touched by, by suffering and they decide to engage in, in that particular cause. I think you know, this is something that we should encourage. But when people don't have these prior biases, when, we have, when we're faced with, okay, where should I put my effort? Where should I put my money? That is precisely the kind of case where we need to do the, the, the calculations and find out where we can get the most, the biggest bang for our buck. Now, I know I've been talking for about an hour here and I'm gonna to try, to, um, try to finish up within the next couple of minutes. Um, but 
you know, it's all very well to say that you know, our, our whole emphasis should be reducing suffering. But there are a lot of people in the world who care not just about that, they care about having happy lives. And if we want to spread a culture of compassion, we need to appeal to their interests as well. And so if we, really, if we want to have a set of principles that we expect the whole world in principle to abide by, we need to take into account the interests of, of everyone that we want to respect these principles. And, and that's why I think it's important that we, we incorporate the principle of negative utilitarianism, or the plus version that I proposed, into something larger. And, and the, the four values that I came up with are, well, there are two primary ones, which are freedom and solidarity. Freedom is it's the most essential feeling of what, of, of what one wants as a human being, the freedom to make decisions and to have a sense of control. Compassion is, or, or solidarity, however you want to call it, is about reducing suffering. It's about taking active steps to reduce suffering among others. So I think that this combination of freedom and solidarity is a pretty universally acceptable um, basis for, 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 a, for a more detailed value system. And then as secondary values, we could include diversity and continuity, because these are what gives li give our lives meaning. Diversity in all different forms, diversity of cultures, of languages, of experiences. We all want diversity in our lives because it makes our lives rich and meaningful. And continuity, well, that's a big question because we were, I was talking earlier, a lot of my talk has been about, you know, is continuity something that we should actually value? But provided that we, provided that our primary emphasis is on reducing suffering, I think we can still try to propose a value system that includes continuity because by giving, by valuing continuity, you give people hope in the future. And when people have hope, they're more likely to take action. So, you know, there, there's also an instrumental reason to believe in, in continuity as a value because we're more likely to work together to reduce suffering if we feel that we have a future to look forward to. Um, <clears throat> so these are the four values, freedom, solidarity, continuity, and diversity. And, you know, is a utopia possible? Um, you know, we can design a, try to design a utopia on the basis of these values. Um, the, the, and, and this would be a matter of turning all these values into real principles um, based on, on, on providing, uh, reducing suffering, providing meaning to people's lives, and taking a very rationalistic approach to solving uh, social problems. The problem is that technology is continuing to increase, and, and it's not really clear how we could ever, ever create a, a perfectly stable situation. Um, but I think it's at least a, an ideal to work towards. And finally, I, I just have a couple of, just two slides where I want to go through very quickly uh, some of the principles which I mentioned in my book that I think can be useful for making an impact. And the first and maybe the most important one is that I think there's a need for ambitious new organizations and initiatives. And as I wrote, <clears throat> I, would see, <clears throat> uh, I would see the use for, for an organization that can successfully tap into the expertise and insight of specialists from a range of relevant disciplines that possesses the necessary drive, creativity, intelligence, influence, and organizational skills, and that can set in motion a project that forges a universal global consensus around a defined common set of humanitarian goals. Something of a humanitarian Manhattan Project, which was a term for the uh, project during World War II that developed the atomic bomb in the US, with a similarly focused intensity, but with peaceful aims. Now, nobody said it was going to be easy. Um, that's quite a tall order. But I, I really think there's a need for this, kind of, for this kind of massive project that tries to draw on uh, thinking and findings from many different fields and tries to integrate it into the best possible, um, the best possible strategy. And I think transparency in advocating Universal humanitarian values is also essential. Um, I think we need to be transparent in in uh, in any kind of advocacy that we that we do, uh, because by transparency you're showing people what what the reasoning is, and you're showing that you, there's no hidden agenda. We need to make effective use of self-interest because we have to acknowledge human nature in any long-term strategy, and we have to do what we can to persuade people 
Uh, and rational argumentation is just one part of the toolbox. We also have to appeal to people's interests. I think we need to entrench processes by raising the exit barriers. If we want to create a stable situation with, with little or no suffering, then we need to create conditions so that, that, so that it remains stable. And uh, you know, this is more of an idea. Uh, there are probably different strategies that can be, that can be taken to try to, try to achieve it. Um, pragmatic detachment, as I was saying. Um, we need to understand how the system works and, and not blame people, even though it's a very human instinct. And again, I think, I think it's critical that we make systematic use of findings from a diverse range of fields. Because the problems we're facing and the, the, the attempt to reduce suffering, it's really one big puzzle that we need to solve. And we need to integrate the knowledge from many different disciplines and try to make the most effective use of it. I think there needs to be greater use of um, intuitively clear metrics so that we can keep, a, we can, we can keep track of the, of the problems that we're trying to deal with and see what our progress is over time. And again, I think we need sophisticated computer models that can help guide our decision-making and strategies. Um, we need to harness empathy wisely because it's a limited resource. We need to tie empathy. When we can trigger empathy in people, we need to tie it to concrete actions that they can take. We need to encourage individuals to act as agents of change and to see how they can make a quantum difference and so make a difference that wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred if they hadn't done whatever they're doing. So we need to, to encourage people to, to, to make a real difference in the world. And finally, I think there's a need to orchestrate and to connect people emotionally. Because one of our biggest challenges in affecting major global change is to achieve critical mass. And I think, you know, orchestration means not leaving individuals to act on instinct alone and to try to ensure that principles of best practice and empiricism are, are applied. Because reason desperately needs emotion as an ally. A rational approach to achieving change requires that we appeal to people's sense of being part of something larger and then urge them to get, tied, caught, to, um, get caught up in a tide of feeling. So, to summarize, the future of our planet and its inhabitants is in our hands. And we need, to, we need to aim high and have ambitious goals if we ever would have any chance of reaching them. And I think our best chance is to spread compassionate humanism through ambitious projects that combine creativity and the systematic application of the tools of rationality. Thanks very much.